Well, first of all, you try to do it on your own and you realize pretty quickly, you're an idiot to think you can do it on your own. It's way too complicated. Your team is really good at constantly looking at the data and making little tweaks. It's elevated everything, right? We've seen it literally transform how effective our advertising could be. We went through several providers, but it's so easy to get taken advantage of. And then ultimately we ended up with you guys and it's been a really great partnership. Mayo, welcome. Thank you. Uh, First off, I just want to say that it's been awesome working with you for we coming up on two years now, mm -hmm. I believe, which is really cool. And really what I want to use in this time is just really understanding you, your business, kind of what you've been through over the past many years of running your business. So I'm going to hand it off to you. Tell us your story. Tell us how you started. Tell us about your brand, what your brand is, and please take the floor. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for interviewing me. That's flattering. So I'm Maya Crothers. I'm the founder of Surf Cell Skincare. And my background is somewhat corporate. Went to engineering school, but worked primarily on the business side of tech. And then uh, went back to get an MBA and then worked in consulting and took some positions in corporate America. And after having two children, I retired and decided to become a PTA mom. And then when my kids were in preschool, my family and I decided to move to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So we don't move to a place like Jackson Hole. It's a small town in the mountains, hard to get to. Thinking you're going to have sort of a corporate act two in life. I kind of thought that I would settle into being a mom and volunteer work and sort of an outdoorsy life. You know, we don't have malls or arcades or, you know, things like that. In Jackson Hall, your entertainment tends to be being outside. I, you know, I think you can say idle hands are the devil's tools for someone who'd sort of been an overachiever for most of her life and was raised to be on that track, you know, probably just having a quiet life in the mountains. <laughs> looked a bit of a vacuum. So I met someone who was in the skincare business and I was having challenges with my skin living in the mountains. So where I lived was very dry. We were at very high altitude. You're outside all the time. Like literally everything was falling apart. And, you know, and I'm someone that was used to always having good skin. And I'd met someone in the skincare industry and we just decided to create a product. I mean, for like no real reason <laughs> other than I think I was bored. So I like to say I'm an accidental entrepreneur was not planning, you know, it's kind of like late for someone to do what I decided doing. And then ultimately she decided to leave the business and I somehow ended up running it <laughs> and ended up as the face of the brand, which I find to be the most uncomfortable part of being an entrepreneur. You know, some people really like the spotlight. I mean, I'm that person that likes being by myself with a spreadsheet. So that's kind of how it started. It's amazing. I really want to first off just say like, I know that you're from our time working together. You don't want to be behind the camera, behind the spotlight. And I really do want to unpack kind of some of the things that we've done together, more specifically around what you've had to do, being the solo founder, like becoming the face of the brand more and more, because like I could justify it through just the numbers because they're it's game changing from, you know, I won't say all your metrics, but it's game changing for what happens when, you know, we go from let's run with an influencer or let's run UGC from a paid platform to Let's put you behind the screen and you talk from a place of authenticity. And that's, it's massively different. But before we even get there, I think it's really interesting how you kind of went from sounds pretty super corporate-y to out in the woods to, uh, that's an overstatement, but rural Wyoming to kind of back in it a little bit. Honestly, you kind of get used to, I think the part that becomes addictive that you can't leave behind is being in nature and having solitude when you want it. So when I'm in the city, like what I always notice in New York when I'm in New York City is there's no place to go and have a phone call. There's always background noise. I mean, you have to like be in your apartment or in your hotel room. And even then, like there's construction or the, and you know, for someone who's used to being in quiet, I find that extremely distracting. The business kind of started sort of on accident in a way. You did it for yourself. What were your first few products that you launched and why? So our first product, we don't even sell anymore, right? Like clearly had no idea what we're doing. And I mean, I really kind of viewed it as a hobby, right? And it was a two-part product that we used 
tourmaline and tourmaline naturally carries an electric charge and there's a lot of data around you know electricity is good for skin and we had a hundred different actives we wanted to throw everything in there anyway it was a great product and people loved it it was impossible to manufacture <laughs> just because it was so complicated and really you know what was one product really probably should have been 20 and you know the other thing about formulating was with every additional active ingredient you add you know, there's a greater probability that somebody's going to have a reaction to it, right? Because now you have so many things in there. And so, you know, we learned a little something about formulating and we still have, even today, people that reach out, where can I get that product? And it's like, oh, we don't make that anymore. So it really kind of started off to me as a hobby, as a journey. It wasn't something I needed to do. There wasn't something driving me to do it. It literally was, I just had free time and I enjoyed doing it. And that product did do well. But then our next products, were a cleanser, a toner, and a product that oxygenates the skin and drives oxygen into the skin. So we really believe, and this kind of fits in, you know, one of the best parts of mountain lifestyle is again, you're outside all the time, you're moving all the time, you're walking all the time, you're literally driving circulation. Circulation is life. You know, as we age, our circulation slows down. That's one of the primary causes of aging. And we primarily were in the professional segment we sold to spas and we had enough traction that we just kind of kept going. And, you know, it was a slow process, right? Like this whole thing took a few years because I was not necessarily in a hurry. And so I kind of woke up one day and realized, oh, I kind of have a real business here. So then I kind of started thinking about it a little bit more and start launching more products. What was like that milestone turning point that you felt like, whoa, this is like, this is happening? So really it was just the traction we were getting. So, you know, again, we primarily were focused on the professional space and like some really significant spas became our partners. So we had a Four Seasons, we had the Stein Erickson Lodge. I mean, we're primarily like high performance you know, like extreme environments, like that's what drove, you know, how does someone who lives in a place like me get my skin to look good? And so if I can do that, gosh, how would, you know, this will work for everybody, right? If it can survive this environment. And so places like the Stein Erickson Lodge, one of the Four Seasons, the Core Club in New York City, Joanna Checks place in, in Dallas, they kind of liked the company and the products. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, we really we've really got something here. And then eventually we landed Neiman Marcus as well. And we were in 10 of their sort of top doors. You know, now what's interesting is, so, you know, all of that motivated me to sort of keep doing it. And, but we've sort of really pivoted to kind of focus a, a little bit more on digital, you know, since COVID. And, you know, and there's a reason for that. We can talk about that. Um, both personal and professional. But, you know, that sort of validation kept me in the game. And also, you know, for someone like me, again, living in small town, nice to have something to tinker with. So, you know, I'm probably not in the same place as you are. You're a young man. You know, you're ready to set the world on fire. That's not necessarily my motivation, right? Because I feel like I had a whole other career and, and sort of did all that. You know, for me, this is more something that I enjoy doing. I wake up every day and like doing it. I try to make the best decision I can every day, but I wouldn't say I'm, I'm probably quite as driven as, as you given where you are in life, if that makes sense. To completely. And I think that's hopefully nice for someone to hear like e-commerce in general, and especially like small to medium sized e-commerce stores, it's like a shark world. Like everyone's just trying to like win. And you could tell, like, kind of like you said, that environment is usually full of people who are like, I'm going to go from a million dollars a year to $20 million a year. And this is how quick I'm going to do. And very few are like, life's awesome. And I'm going to just use this business to have an awesome life, which is like the actual purpose of having a independent business, right? It's like, do what you want to do on your own terms, go wherever you want to go, whenever you want to go there and not have to feel like, oh, it's 9 a.m. on Monday. Time to log in now, right? And I think that's kind of the difference that you're in and how I'm viewing it is you're creating products that are actually good or you're not thinking about take a, I don't want to throw any brand under the bus, but take a mega brand who's in your same category, like the luxury skincare category. The first thing that they think about when there's a product that comes out is, is there demand for this product? What can my margins be for this product? How quickly can we run through this inventory? Very, very 
often they're focused on the financials. And it seems like at least you come at it from a scenario of, yes, okay, I need to make money, right? I'm not, this isn't a charity, but you're also coming at it from what is actually going to be better than all the other products. How can we formulate that? How can we make that nice for the consumer? That, that's absolutely true. So we don't engineer search sell from a spreadsheet. You know, I mean, I really like to deliver products that are products that I want to use, that I know my friends would want to use. We don't have a vitamin A product, which is retinol or retinoid. And people are like, well, you really need that to round out your line. Well, I use retin-A and it's amazing. I don't think I can do anything better than that. So I'm not going to launch a retinoid product. And again, I have the sort of the luxury, you know, to be able to run my business that way. But yeah, we craft our products. We take a long time to formulate them. And it's really about more what I want to deliver than sort of financial engineering. But I love it. I want to delve into a little bit of your advertising, right? Because obviously that's what we've been working on together. So I, I want to understand, you know, as your business matured, right? And as, you know, I think you mentioned like a pretty big tentpole event, which was you know present for most businesses because COVID comes around 2020, right? And that makes you have to change everything. I'm sure a lot of the places that you were stocking your best products in were like, hey, we have no one coming here right now. So a lot changes, right? So I want to understand like when you shifted to e-commerce, what were you doing from an advertising perspective before you started to work with us? And then, you know, eventually we can get into when you started to actually work with us. We were primarily spa and Neiman Marcus was our first big retail partner. And so we did a lot of, you know, your spa is really your customer. You know, it's a lot of training and events in spa. And in Neiman Marcus, we were constantly in store having events. I was going from store to store to store there all day talking to customers. When I wasn't there, we had our own people in there and we were doing other things, but primarily like we did a lot of traditional PR where, you know, Allure would write about us or, you know, the, the traditional beauty press would write about us, but it was primarily being in the brick and mortar and talking directly to the consumer and our direct to consumer was, you know, we didn't put a ton of effort into it. And then under COVID, it just started growing on its own and without doing anything. And of course, retail slowed down. Our spa, weirdly enough, didn't slow down at all. It actually grew. And that's really an interesting story right there. So the majority of our spas were individual kind of one-off spas. A lot of them are owner-operated. And these people had to hustle, right? Because they weren't allowed to keep their spas open. So they were doing a lot of sort of digital direct-to-consumer. They were having they were having lives on Instagram. They were doing curbside pickup. I was so inspired. And our business actually grew, right? Because they were, couldn't do treatments, but they could sell product. And so we sold more product. Of course, kind of more traditional retail brick and mortar, that business just completely went away. And what I learned was through these digital outlets, because spa kind of turned into digital just through, you know, just once removed, right? We were doing that directly. That business grew enough to make up for what I was losing in traditional brick and mortar retail. And we actually went beyond and I never had to leave my house. <laughs> retail has so many moving parts. I mean, you need people and training and testers and there's attrition and it's just heavy lifting. And it was a eureka moment for me. And you know, for someone who is an introvert, <laughs> I thought, I like this a lot more. So it took us a minute to kind of get our act together because we hadn't done enough of it. I didn't even know what I was doing. And it's a very, very, very complicated ecosystem. So the first time you try to do it, you just get screwed. <laughs> well, first of all, you try to do it on your own and you realize pretty quickly, you're an idiot to think you can do it on your own. It's too complicated. There's Amazon's an ecosystem, Meadow's an ecosystem, TikTok's an ecosystem, you know. So you just don't even think you can. Yeah. Fine, play around with it just so you can realize how dumb you are, but then go out and get professional help. But it's so easy to kind of get taken advantage of because it's really complicated and you don't know. They can tell, you know, your providers can tell you anything and all you can do is believe them because it takes you a minute to learn. So we went through several providers and had to get smart and had to learn a lot. And then ultimately we kind of ended up with you guys and it's been a really great partnership. So originally our PR was kind of traditional PR and really kind of face-to-face -face consumer stuff. But we've kind of switched over, you know, digital now is where I want to, I really like it and I want to live. And of course we may, we maintain spa. I like this spa as well. 
Yeah, that that's great. I mean, A, really, really cool how Spa kind of like became the engine for a little bit that's like definitely inspiring there's also that like big support local movement in the country for like almost like a year i'd say which is super cool and then you know you started to mention a few things about like previous providers pre i assume like agencies and consultants from an advertising perspective that you work with whether it was facebook ads google ads whatever and how there's like always a trust issue. One thing that I notice when I have conversations with different brands or brands that are considering working with us, almost everyone that has been around the block a little bit has said, I've been burned. I've been burned here, I've been there. Or, you know, they said we were doing really well, but the Shopify never said it. There's always one little like pin in the side or whatever they call that, like a thorn in the side that, and owners have trouble like getting over that hump. And I understand first off, cause like I have probably things like that in my life in a different facet. And I think one of the other points you made, which is so key is like, there is just a point where you do have to just roll the dice again sometimes. And the only way that you could, I don't want to say the only way it's going to work is to keep trying, but like kind of, and also look for proof, look for case studies and look for real people saying that they enjoyed the experience that they got ABC. Well, I mean, and it's like anything else, you know, just being an entrepreneur in general, like yeah. you try something, it doesn't work. You get up, you try again. That doesn't work. You can try again. Like, you know, you can't, you have to keep trying. That's how you get there. You know, one of the things that I tell my kids is success is just a series of failures. You know, you just keep getting up and trying again. And so that's, you know, that's kind of what we've done in the digital world. And I, you know, I kind of feel like, okay, I kind of know enough now, I think, you know, to, to kind of make smart decisions. I'm not smart enough to be able to do it myself, but I can kind of, you know, look at data and tell up the date. Cause it's the thing about this digital world is if you don't know what you're doing, it's easy to be lied to and maybe lied to lie. Lie is too strong of a word, but you can make stuff look like it's that it's working when it's not, you know, someone can show you that campaigns are responsible for these sales when they're not, you know, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors. So you kind of have to be smart enough to be able to dig below that surface a little bit. Yeah, I think that's one thing we did really good together was I feel like when we first started on our side, we actually thought we were doing better than we were. And along the way, we recognized that it's silly that Shopify wasn't you know, integrated into our reporting. It, you know, it, it just natural things that you learn as you grow the business from, from my side. And especially over the last six months or so, like we've shed so many things that didn't work and we're able to now just really lock into the things that do work right some of the some of the creative concepts of a lot of which feature you a lot of the hooks that are starting to work and just as simple as like campaign structure and how we optimize the accounts i don't want to get into like the exact details of it but like the things that don't work it's completely okay to say this is not for this business right like just push it aside it's not driving that new incremental growth let's like just look at what's the bank account say sometimes is that's that's the ultimate measure of this whole thing right it's not did we get our cpms down or our click through rates up like those are good to know but they don't make us more money right and that's advertising should be in and out right it should be cash in cash out and how do we maximize that return right right and i just you know to give you a plug i mean your team is really good at like constantly looking at the data and making little tweaks and you know, we worked people in the past who said, well, we're not, you know, we're only going to look at it for two weeks. And I'm like, okay, but I see money flying out the door. And that's a very standard thing. And I've come to believe that agencies really only tell you that. They tell you, you know, you need those two weeks to really know. But the truth is, well, maybe it's not the truth. Maybe it's just partially the truth. I mean, in order for them to be profitable, they need to have enough clients per headcount, you know, which means that they don't have time to go in and look at everybody's every day and make changes. And I'm not saying changes need to be made every day, but sometimes you don't need two weeks to know it's not working. Yeah, that's a huge red flag, I'd say. Like, there's definitely things that you have to wait on in advertising period. Like, you need a certain number of purchases to be sure, or there is a lot of metrics to look at. But saying that we will we're definitely not going to change or we're definitely not going to even look at it for a certain period of time is crazy, right? That's bad news. And one of the things that we did on our side is again, like huge shout out to the team because they're super good and you only get to work with a small portion of the team. And one of the things we do on our side that has worked really, really well, because you're right, like it's an agency. You're not, we're not managing one account at a time. It's not one person for one account or else 
they'd be an employee, right? <laughs> it's a little different. So they're juggling a few different businesses and we have checklists on our side that are like, okay, on a daily basis, you need to do this with every single account, right? And then on a weekly basis, there's these four things that you need to do with every single account. But then if you do those things, then there's opportunity for you to have the bright idea that makes everything else that you're doing exponentially grow. You know, one of those things for you, which I keep coming back to is like getting you more in front of the camera. That plus structure, plus figuring out that shops and, and doing all the little things that we did, plus being like, cha-ching, this, this is the one thing and like shining the spotlight on you a little bit, which I know it doesn't make you comfortable, but it's elevated everything, right? We've seen it literally transform how effective our advertising could be. And now if we just keep doing the same checklist daily, weekly, monthly, and then another idea will come, it might be tomorrow, it might be six months from now, but a second idea will come and then we get the next layer, the next loud. That's how I think about it. Agreed. Agree. And I mean, I definitely see it working with you guys versus some of the other agencies we've worked with. And prior to you, we worked with tidy agencies. We worked with a big fancy agency that only does beauty. By the way, they nearly bankrupted us, you know, so we definitely shopped around. I like the way you guys do things. Thank you. I want to use the last few minutes here to wrap a few things up. One question I really like to ask, and I want you to be, I want you to brag a little bit here. So... <laughs> I want to know what the one thing you think you did exceptionally well. Like what's one thing you believe you did exceptionally well that contributed most to the success of the business? Oh, goodness. That's really hard because I think you mostly, you know, think about what you've done wrong. You know, what you wish you could do differently. Gosh, Sam, any other questions? <laughs> I think the two things kind of recently in the last two to three years that I've done that have really had the most impact is one is really make the commitment to understand this digital world. And it's low and it's time consuming and it's frustrating, but you just got to dig in, right? And then the other thing, and it's just, it's going to sound boring, but it's just getting really medieval about what's really driving profitable revenue and what's not. And just ruthless even if it's something that's a you know two hundred dollars a month subscription it doesn't matter if it's not adding value just get rid of it and that's time consuming and boring right because you're constantly having to dig into your p l's and going well wait what's that really doing for us and you know and trying to really understand the digital world too just the ability to you know to be able to do that to do the time consuming boring stuff yeah i couldn't agree with you more the repetitive, most boring tasks of the day, are usually the ones that move you the most forward. At least how I see it, it's just totally agree. I love the idea of being frugal on profitability, being a skeptic on profitability. It's critical. Like people forget about it. They look at their account and they're like, I only made $46 this month. What happened? Where did it go? And it's like, oh, I just paid that platform 800 bucks and that one 300 and that one 200. And it's like, are these apps even doing it for me, right? Like what's going on? So anyway. It was really nice to have this conversation, May. I appreciate it. We love working and the team, mm -hmm. truly. I think everyone always has nice things to say about working with you. And we're glad everything's been going very well lately. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. I love your team. They're great. Thank you. And um, it's been great working with you. Thank you. I appreciate it.